Well, hello, everybody. Wow. This is a big crowd for a Saturday. How y'all doing? I see some of you already started to let me know where you're from. Um, my name is Nick, uh, Nick Mikesell. I'm one of the trend and design managers here at Michaels. Um, really, thanks for joining us today for this free online class. Really appreciate it. If you haven't yet, please take a moment. Um, let me know where you're from in the chat. Uh, I'm here located in Dallas, Texas. Um, it's sunny, but it's cold. <laughs> Believe it or not, cold in Texas, right? But um, it, it, we're expecting snow tomorrow. Crazy. Um, anyways, uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your weekend to come here and um, uh, listen to me talk about, about art. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I hope you all are having a great weekend so far. Um, mine's been awesome. I, you know, this is where I want to be talking art with all my great new friends. Uh, so thank you again for 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 joining joining me. Uh, um, Valerie, hi. <laughs> Anyways, um, so this class, um, what this is, it's a watercolor class. It's a beginning to watercolor class. So. Um, what I'm going to be covering today is going to be very foundational. If you haven't worked in watercolor before, if you've been intimidated by it, um, this is the class for you. Uh, if you have experience working in watercolor class or, or in, wa in watercolor, then this is a great class just for um, getting some uh, remedial education, uh, so to speak, uh, on some some uh, of the uh, basics, the super basics. So the plan is what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through um, some introductions to some really uh, high level tips. Um, also the characteristics of watercolor, some of the tools, um, and we're also going to do a little crash course on color theory. Um, if you know anything about color theory, raise your hand. Awesome. You got a few people raising your hands. Great. So then again, this is, you know, you might want to, uh, um, uh, if I say something that you haven't, you, you haven't heard before, then please, you know, say awesome. Good. That's great. Um, so again, but this is primarily a class that um, is geared for the beginner. So um, uh, I, I, if you are that expert, um, really appreciate you being here. Um, and I hope you can pick up something that will, or at least if you have some experience, you'll pick up something uh, from this class. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, we are recording this class. So if I'm going too fast, I apologize. It is one hour, so it's really hard to kind of compact. Um, and I want to get as much information and value to you guys in this class um, within the one hour. But if you miss something, um, you know, you can watch this back. It should be available again uh, on Michael's uh, onlineclasses.com or michaels.com slash online classes or just actually michaels.com slash classes. Sorry, I don't hope I don't confuse any of you guys, but um, it should be available within 24 to 48 hours. So you can um, watch it back and uh, catch something that you may have missed. Um, I can, I see some people asking if I can see you. I can only see a handful of you um, just at the top of my Zoom bar. I don't have the gallery view, um, but uh, um, so, okay, let's start talking about watercolor. Now, watercolor is one, it, it's one of those mediums that can be absolutely satisfying. Um, but there are a few real high level tips that I'd like to start with. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, if you don't mind, Bianca, could we change to the overhead view? Um, and please feel free to continue to ask questions in the chat. I will try to, if I see something, I'm glancing over, um, I'll answer it really quickly. If not, Bianca will stop me and um, uh, let me know that you have some questions. Um, so, okay, first things first, let's talk about some high level watercolor tips. Number one, and this is very important, um, if you are new to watercolor um, and if you want to have, if you want to, have that satisfying watercolor experience. And that is be patient. Watercolor is one of those artistic mediums that um, you can't rush it. You have to take your time with it because of course we're walking, we're working with water and it's unlike some of the, uh, some of its cousins like 
acrylic and oil where you can really work into the paint and be quick. You can do blending. Watercolor behaves differently, again, because we're using water as the primary medium to transport the pigment. So be patient with it. Take it easy um, and it, uh, don't try to rush it ever because if you do that, that's when the frustration can start. Um, number two, that's what we, we have to remember to work light to dark. I'll get into this a little bit more, but you never want to go too dark too quickly um, because the way that watercolor works, and uh, again, I'm going to get into these basic techniques um, where you're layering it up. If you go too dark, it's really difficult to pull out lightness. So um, it's, it's easier to darken things, but it's hard, more difficult to lighten things, okay? And then number three in these top three watercolor tips, it's leave it alone. Now, what I mean by this, by leave it alone, is that when you apply the watercolor to your paper, um, you don't want to play with it too much. You don't want to force it. You don't want to push it around. You want to let the watercolor do its thing, especially if you're doing wet in wet applications, which is a technique that we will cover today and I will show you. You want to let it completely dry before you start messing with it. And the reason why is because you can get muddy and you can, and if you truly try to control too much of the of watercolor, that's when things can get a little, a little dicey, a little, a little uh, tricky, and that's where you can get a little bit um, over overwhelmed, if, if, if you will. All right, so those are those three high level tips that I um, wanted to start with. Um, in general, for beginners, one uh, a few other things just for you as an artist, if you are a novice artist and you're just starting out um, uh, your artistic journey, I want to impart four general tips to you that, again, will also help you not only with watercolor, but with any other materials that you're using. And so those general tips, and trust me, I promise, we will get to painting. We will get to the actual um, painting soon. Um, number one, go easy on yourself. Um, Oops, I can't spell. Honestly, um, don't be so hard on yourself. Don't, don't, that's how you can get discouraged. Um, I know for me, um, you know, art is all about trial and error, right? It's all about practice. It's all about your, you know, that journey of learning the mediums. So don't be overly critical on yourself. I know myself, uh, I'm talking to myself right now too, because still I can go, I can be really hard on myself uh, as well. Um, going hand in hand with going e go easy on yourself is try to avoid perfection. Um, perfection is something that can drive you mad. Um, just try to take things, again, take it in small chunks. Um, so um, it, it, we're not, I'm, for me, whenever I try to start, whenever I try um, start drawing, painting, sculpting, whatever it is that I'm doing. I'm not too worried about making sure something looks exactly like, like what it is, whatever it is that I'm trying to, um, to create. Um, I, I, perfection is something that I think, you know, only a handful of people are really, really good at. And though, you know, there's some people who can do hyper-realism really, really well. Um, I just, you know, for me, art has become just a, it, it, it's a stress relief. It's something that I enjoy doing. Um, so one of, the, one of those things that I try to do is I try to avoid perfection. Um, number three is start small. What I mean by start small is don't try to go in and especially if we're talking about watercolor here and try to go and say, I am going to paint a nice big floral arrangement right now it's, you're gonna run into um, discouragement, trust me. You wanna start small, you wanna ease your way in. Do a small painting, do, don't, don't work too big right away. Let's just ease our way into it. Um, you'll find that it'll be a lot more reward, rewarding that way. And then lastly, 
practice. Of course, we hear this all the time, right? Practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect. Well, it's true, it does. Um, uh, the more you practice in the medium, the, the more that you become more familiar and you learn things. So just keep doing it, keep working into it, um, just like anything in life. As long as you keep working at it, you'll, you'll get better at it. All right, so those are for my beginners, those four tips for you. All right, let's get back to watercolor. So I'm gonna talk about um, three main characteristics of, let's see if I can spell this right. Did I do it? Yes, I did, okay. Three main characteristics of watercolor. Number one, it's transparent. Watercolor is, it's the way that we work in watercolor, unlike some of our, its cousins, acrylic and oil, pastel even, um, those are opaque, the opaque mediums, meaning, well, acrylic you can use in thin layers for sure, oil you can thin it out and you can use it in, in thin layers, but when it comes to watercolor, it's primarily, and I, I stress this, that it is a, it's, it's a medium of thin layers, that when you layer them on top of each other, that that's how you kind of create depth, how you create value. Um, that's how you build your, your shadows in your form. So that's what we're working in. We're working in layers of transparent color. Um, I don't recommend using watercolor straight out of the tube. Um, when I get to the paint, actual talking about our paints, um, I'll go a little bit more into detail there. But that's one of the main characteristics of, of watercolors that we use, we use it in transparent layers. Number two, this side, it, it bleeds or what we also call blooms. Again, wa water is our main medium here. So the way that it works, you know, the, it, you, the pigment uses what's called capillary action that works within the water that draws it out, that makes it bloom. When we get into the wet on wet technique, you'll, you'll see this. It's, um, it's really, it's a cool effect. Um, and if you watch anything on in, uh, any of the YouTube videos or some Instagram or TikTok videos, you can some, kind of see people who are working in watercolor and they show the really close up view of the, the watercolor pigment kind of bleeding out of the brush into, into the, um, onto the paper and onto the wet surface. Um, so that's one of the other characteristics of it because it wants to spread out. It acts along with the water because um, water from one of its physical natures is that it wants to spread out and cover every, everything that it touches. All right, and then number three, the last char char key characteristic of watercolor here is that it dries lighter than when it's applied. So when you, you got to keep that in mind, when you're applying the watercolor to your paper, the, the actual value that you see, the relative light and dark, um, it's going to dry lighter as opposed to acrylic, where with acrylic, it, it well, when it dries, it actually dries darker. So we got to keep this in mind that um, when we're applying our paint, if you apply it, apply the watercolor, and you're, you're, you think that it's, oh my gosh, this is too dark, let it dry. And then when it dries, you can still see that it, it, it'll dry lighter than it actually is. So we gotta kind of keep that in mind. Okay, awesome. Ashley, I love you too. <laughs> All right, um, now let's talk really quickly about our tools. I'm gonna put my sketch pad to the side and I'm going to talk about some, some of our key tools here. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about brushes. Um, there's all sorts of different types of brushes. Um, the brushes that I'm starting you out with today are, um, and all of these, let me first say, all of these materials that you have, um, that, are, that you have, that I have, um, they were also included in the materials list on the invite page on the Michaels um, online classes website. Um, so it, you know, it, 
If you don't have them, that's perfectly fine. Make a note, um, but you can go back to the invite, I believe, and you should be able to see today at least, um, and you can see the materials list. But the I, I included a set of basic brushes in there. Um, and that set included, um, and I'm gonna take out these two because these two brushes were not included in that set, but it included this big brush right here that almost looks like um, a, a makeup brush. Uh, but this is called a mop brush. And what this is really great for is you can really saturate, you can really saturate the uh, bristles here um, with a lot of water so that you can create giant, a, a, a large swash of co coverage um, on your surface, on your paper. Um, there's also a flat brush um, that is square tipped as you guys can see here. Um, this flat brush is kind of, it, it, it has slight chiseled shape to it when you can see it here uh, from its side view. Let me get a little bit closer. Sorry, it's not focusing too well. Sorry about that. But um, this is really good for, it'll give you some wide strokes, but also thin strokes because of the, because of that um, uh, flat tip. Um, but this is really good for, um, I like to use this particular brush um, to make some nice even strokes um, and even, even some line work with it too. Um, you also have a round brush. If you're familiar with brushes, then you probably know what all these brushes are about. And then you can kind of see, let me see if I can bring it from here. This is kind of crazy, so you can kind of see it, but it has a pointed tip. These brushes come in different sizes um, and uh, the round brushes are great for details. Um, there's also a, a pointer, or not a pointer, this is like a really, uh, this is like a triple zero detail brush, and also because it has a really fine tip, this is good for even finer details like making some lines or some smaller dots. Um, so that's like a detail brush there. Um, also, there was a, um, there was a fan brush that was included in that set um, that, um, that, that's on the materials list. Uh, but when I received it, it was damaged. So instead I pulled out one of my own trusty fan brushes. These brushes are great because they can create some really interesting effects. Um, I don't use this brush too much in watercolor, but it's really great for dry brush applications or for creating some, some uh, uh, different stroke. I can play with it a little bit and you guys can see what I mean by it, but it can create some kind of like um, uh, really rough strokes. Um, you can also use it um, uh, in a dabbing technique. Um, you all remember Bob Ross, right? You know, one of my childhood, childhood heroes, uh, he loved this brush. He loved using it to create his trees. Um, and then also, one of, this is my uh, favorite brush that I like to use in watercolor. It's a one inch flat brush. Um, it's similar to this half inch flat brush here, but it's a little bit bigger. And I love using this brush to create flat washes. And I'll show you that technique in a second. Um, really quickly talking about bristles, the actual bristles themselves, these are synthetic bristles, but um, they come in different, uh, different types of um, bristles with, there's a lot of them are animal hair. Um, they tend to be a little bit more expensive when they're animal hair than synthetic, um, especially when you get into the sables. Um, those can be really pricey, but they're great brushes. Uh, but these brushes that you have here, these synthetic brushes are perfectly fine. There's ox hair brushes that are really good too. Um, but it, as a beginner, um, I would recommend don't settle on cheap brushes. Don't go on price alone because that's when you can get frustrated. There is truth when you say materials matter. Um, the better the materials are, the better your experience, um, the, be the more rewarding your experience will be. Okay, so those are our brushes. Um, Bianca, do we have any questions? Um, may I, did, I, did I miss anything? No? Yeah. Um... So someone wanted to know um, when you're talking about brushes, like what about white nylon brushes? Um, um, that it, it, the, it all depends with the nylon brushes. As long, uh, one of the um, with one of the characteristics or the for watercolor, you want to stick with um, brushes that are going to be really kind of loose and soft, like soft bristle brushes. Some of those nylon brushes can get a little firm. 
Um, and I definitely do not recommend using any oil or acrylic uh, uh, bristle brushes that are, are firm because they don't, they don't hold the watercolor very as well as say these brushes do. Um, so you want to go with a soft textured brush. Um, they do have some nylon brushes that are that like that. Just if, if you're using it for watercolor, then I would definitely um, use uh, stick to using these uh, softer bristle brushes. All right, so let's keep talking about our tools. I know some of you are probably eager to get to see me start painting. Um, but uh, I really want to make sure since this is a, to reiterate, this is a beginner's class. So we are covering all the materials. I want to introduce them to you, give you a little bit of background, and then um, show you those techniques. And I'll get into those really quickly. Now let's talk about paint. Um, you probably notice that watercolor paints come in these small tubes. And the reason why is because watercolor paint goes a long way. You don't need a lot. Um, you're using the watercolor pigment uh, in these tubes to tint your water. Um, unlike with like acrylic or oil paint that come in the larger tubes because you need to use a lot more of it. Uh, so that's why they come in these smaller tubes. Um, the particular brand that I have here is a Windsor & Newton. We also um, have Grumbacher at um, uh, Michael's and these are really great uh, paints to start out with. Um, in your watercolor journey. So um, I've got three different paints here. I'm gonna get into why three different colors. I know there's four, there's two yellows, but I'm gonna talk about that uh, shortly why there's two different yellows. But with the paint, with this paint, um, if you remember earlier, I said, you don't wanna use it straight out of the tube in a thick application because that's just wasting the paint. If you need a thicker application, let's say you wanna put white over something, use acrylic. Um, use an acrylic paint because that's going to be more opaque and you can use it in a thicker application to make sure that it's not transparent. All right, so um, let's now talk about paper. Um, this particular, there's two different, two different key types of paper. There's cold press and then there's hot press. Um, this particular pad that I have here is a cold press watercolor paper. The weight on it is 140 pounds, so it's a little bit of a thicker weight paper. Um, the actual paper that I had in the material list um, was a watercolor block paper pad. Um, and what a, this is just a regular standard, you know, uh, ring, ring bound um, watercolor pad. Um, and these are perfectly fine as a beginner. When it comes, the reason why though, I wanna make sure that I explain to you the, the watercolor pad, that actually comes where there's like, it's glued on the side so that it's like a block. That's why it's called a watercolor block. Um, and the reason why I suggested that is because it is, it is, um, it helps prevent uh, warping, sorry. Um, uh, with these, when you're, with, when you're working with water on these loose paper, um, it, it'll tend to warp. And that can be a point of frustration, I'm sure, uh, for some beginning artists. So that's why I recommend using a thicker, heavier weight watercolor paper for a beginner. Um, and you start out with a cold press. And what cold press means is that it has, it's the way that it's produced and it creates it, or it has a surface texture on it. I don't know if you guys can see it too well here um, on my screen, but if I get closer, you can kind of, can you guys kind of see it a little bit there? It's got like a texture to the surface, which cre is, creates those nice, those nice surface textures um, when you're painting. Hot press, um, which actually is my particular favorite uh, paper to use, it is, has a smoother surface, so you have less of that texture. Um, all right, so those are the basic materials. Um, and now I'm gonna re really quickly go through just how the, uh, some of the other tools that I have at my station. You probably noticed I have two sets of um, water here. And there's a reason why I have two sets of water. One is to clean my brushes and one is a clean water source. So make sure you have two clean water or you have two dishes of water 
um, when you set up your station. You're going to want to make sure you have a lot of paper towel too. This comes in very handy. Um, you can use it for lifting, for correcting mistakes, and also it's really good for redirecting the paint. I'll get, I'll show you those techniques in a little bit. I also have um, a spray bottle mister, and what's really good with, with this mister is that you can spray your surface of your paper to get it moist, um, and you can also spray your palette um, with your paint in it to keep it from drying out. Um, when, I also have a piece of scrap paper right here because that's where I test out my colors. You don't want to just mix your color and then go directly into your painting. Having a scrap piece of paper allows you to test your color out first to make sure it's the color that you need. I also have a couple of different palettes here. So um, this is a very common palette. Um, it's a very dirty palette. This is my, <laughs> I've had this for a while. Um, it's got some dried acrylic in it that I've had a hard time get, taking out. But this is a standard palette. You can get these at Michael's. It's got the little wells. These are really great because you can put all your different colors in there um, and, and, and dip from there. Um, but I also have this, uh, this palette. This is my favorite palette that I've used, you can see. Got some dried acrylic in there that I haven't been able to get out, but this is well used. Um, so it has, again, the different wells in it that and compartments where you can mix your paints and keep your watercolor separate. So you definitely want to get a color palette that has these little com um, compartments uh, so that you can contain your water on it. I would not recommend using a flat surface because your water, water will just run everywhere. All right. Um, I also have a sponge here that's lightly dampened and the reason why I'm using this sponge is because it can be used to help lift if you have too much paint pigment. That if you're too dark, um, you can use this damp sponge to kind of lift it up and lighten um, some darker wash applications, but you can also use it when you're, when you are trying to do a dry brush technique, you can use it to take off a little bit of the paint from the brush and that'll allow you to do the dry brush technique. All right. Um, okay. Uh, let's go ahead and get painting. I know you guys have been waiting for a while. I apologize about that. So one of the things, I already got some paint that's dried here in the um, in these wells, and um, that's perfectly fine because I want to show you guys the part of the versatility of watercolor is that even if it dries in your palette, unlike oil or acrylic, once it's dried, you can't use it again. You can't bring it back to life. But when watercolor dries in your palette, you can bring it back to life. Um, so let me get my mister here. And let me get a brush and you can kind of see that it comes right back to life. So you don't have to worry too much about your um, watercolor drying in your palette, unlike um, with uh, acrylic, um, because again, it, it can be resurrected. All right. So I've already designated this dish right here is going to be where I'm going to clean my brushes. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's talk. Let's talk color. So, in the list, what you have in that list is three different colors of paint, and what they are are the primary colors. Um, I listed out an alt. Um, in, I believe a phthalo blue or an ultramarine blue, um, alizarin crimson, and then a lemon yellow. Um, and not all colors are made the same. So not all blue is blue, not all red is red, not all yellow is yellow. Um, I chose this yellow right here, this lemon yellow, because it, ten it really mixes a really great green. I chose this alizarin crimson because it is a little bit warmer and mixes a really great um, violet or purple. And I chose this phthalo um, uh, blue because it, it also leans more towards the violet. It's a little bit warmer, so it mixes even that really great purple. So let's talk about that, cra that crash course of um, uh, color theory. You guys have probably seen these, right? You can pick these up at your uh, at, on Michael's too as well. It's a little color wheel um, and it lists out all the different colors. Um, you have your primary colors, which these are right here, your red, yellows, and blues. And the reason why they're called primary colors is because you cannot mix any other two colors to get them. 
um, the secondary colors, which are your orange, your green, and your violet or purple, are used by mixing two um, primaries together. So when you mix red and yellow together, what do you get? You get orange. When you mix yellow and blue together, what do you get? You get green. When you mix red and blue together, you get violet. So those are your secondary colors. Your tertiary colors are when you mix a secondary color, your orange, your green, your purple, um, with a primary. And that's when you get your red orange, you get your um, you know, red orange right there, your yellow orange, your yellow green, your blue green, your blue violet, and then your red violet. So um, that, that, that's why right now that you can, you, can, you can definitely go out to a store, buy all sorts of different colors. You can buy an orange off the shelf. You can buy a gray off the shelf, a brown off the shelf if you don't want to mix your paints. But um, as a beginner, I highly recommend that you just, you stick to these three colors here. Um, don't even worry about white or black um, and try to mix, because you can mix those browns straight from these colors here. The color theory in general, um, when you mix, ideally, um, when you mix complementary colors and what complementary colors are, are colors from, that are located directly across each other on the color wheel. So you have yellow and you have violet as complementary colors in theory. Um, and I'm not gonna get too into detail. I could spend a whole entire class on color theory. But when you mix yellow and violet together, they're supposed to produce a perfect gray, like a neutral gray. Um, but that usually doesn't happen. Um, it's because there's impurities in these pigments that cause that to happen. Um, and if you were to mix all three colors together, red, yellow, and blue together equally, it would produce perfect black. But again, that doesn't happen because there are impurities in the pigments themselves, these manufactured pigments that prevent that from happening. Okay, so let's start play, laying out some of these paints so I can start painting. I know a lot of you are probably really eager to do some painting. And like I said, you don't need to um, put a lot of paint on your palette, just a little bit. I see a question about non-tube paint. If, I'm sure you're probably talking about paint cakes, like watercolor cakes, those are great. Um, those are absolutely fab fabulous. Yes, you can use those um, watercolor cakes, but as a beginner, uh, start here. Start in um, with uh, your watercolor tubes. They're a little bit more cost effective. And oh, I got my red over here. So as you'll notice, what I'm doing is I'm setting my paints out in different, like my red, my blue, and my yellow in different, um, different compartments. Uh, it's really, you know, you working in watercolor, you definitely want to avoid cross contamination. And what I mean by cross contamination is um, getting your blue into your red, because what's going to happen is that's going to that's going to mess up your pure red here. So if you try to go your red to your yellow to try to make an orange, it's going to make your orange kind of brown because that blue has leaked into the red and vice versa. Okay. Um, I want to go back really quickly. Um, this yellows, um, two these two different yellows. Uh, I was talking about how the lemon yellow has more of a green to it, it's a little bit cooler. Um, the opposite of that is a cadmium yellow, which has more red in it, which is gonna make uh, a warmer orange and a better orange. So that's why I have two yellows, uh, just in case you were wondering. Okay, so let's talk about, let's start with our very first technique here. Um, and it's the most basic of techniques and that is your wash, um, which is, where you have your pigment and I put a little bit of water in here. Let's get this here since it's not tainted too much. And the wash is where you're using your paint where it's mixed and you're just applying it. However, 
uh, right onto the dry surface. So this is also known as just a wet into dry. Um, so my surface here is dry and I'm just using the paint that I have and I'm just applying it directly onto the paper. Now, um, uh, let's talk really quickly about drying time. Usually it takes a while for your paint to dry once you've applied it, uh, depending on how much water you've, you have that you're applying on and how saturated the paper is, uh, drying times are gonna differ, right? You can speed that up. If you have a hair dryer, use your hair dryer, um, just use it on a low setting and you can use that hair dryer to speed it up if you wanna work a little bit quicker um, to set that uh, wash and to dry that wash. Um, I don't have a blow dryer set up. Um, my it's my wife's and I don't wanna break it. Um, so uh, yeah, you can do that. Use that hair dryer to help, um, help you uh, speed up that drying time. Um, now, the next type of wash, besides just doing the regular wet into dry wash, is actually a wet and wet technique. So this is where you moisten the paper. I'm using my, um, my mister here, and I'm just going to wet the paper. You could also do this. This is really cool, um, just to practice, because again, um, before you really start diving into a painting, practice. Uh, Practice your strokes. Practice with the uh, applying the paint with the different um, uh, uh, brushes that you have, and do something like this um, just to kind of mess around and see the effects that happen. Take your mister, this paint that I just applied, and then see what happens. And it starts. This is the what I was talking about. One of the characteristics of watercolor is that it bleeds. It blooms, so to speak. Can you kind of see that, how it's kind of starting to pull it? Because that's that capillary action. The water is pulling the pigments. Uh, so uh, um, just like I said, one of the physical characteristics of water itself is that it wants to expand out and cover everything. So as, it, as the water is doing that, it's pulling the pigment with it. So I kind of moisten this area over here. Let's moisten it a little bit more with that water. Um, you'll probably notice when you start painting that you're going to see some buckling. You're going to see some warping with the paper. That's natural and that's going to happen. Um, and even as it dries, the paper is going to still be warped. Um, that's why when you use a heavier weight paper, the paper that's heavier is going to diminish that amount of warping that's happening. Um, if you use a thinner weight paper, anything below like a 140 pound weight paper is really going to buckle and warp even more, and you're probably going to get frustrated with it. All right, so this area is a little moist. Hopefully it's, it's wet enough, and you can take your brush and you can just go right in. And notice how I'm, I'm applying the paint, and I'm using my trusty one inch flat brush here. Um, Quick answer to the question that was just asked. Um, this particular paper that I'm using here is 140 pound. It's 140 pound cold press, um, and it's a very common uh, weight paper in watercolor. So you can see what's happening here as I'm working into this wet and wet technique. Um, I'm using the corner of my number or my one inch um, flat brush um, just to apply apply that pigment apply the watercolor to it. Now, remember one of the things that I said as a watercolor tip, um, one of the three watercolor tips, it was number three, which is leave it alone. And for those of you who may have joined a little late, let me show you, I had written down these watercolor tips. They are number one, be patient. Don't try to force things. Let you know um, watercolor is not a quick and speedy uh, material. Work light to dark. Um, build your values up slowly, and then leave it alone. Let it do its thing. Don't try to push it around too much. So um, this is that wet and wet technique I was talking about. Let me hold it up a little bit closer to the camera so you can see how the water is kind of bleeding in there and moving around. Now, one of the things you can do also is if you do want to, um, maybe you wanna mess around with this just a little bit, but what I wouldn't do is 
Um, I wouldn't go in there at this point um, because you want to see how the how it dries, um, especially if you're going to be using more than one color in here, which I'm about to do. I'm going to throw some color in here. But if you want to kind of move it around, you can. You can kind of distribute it, but that's the best that I can tell you to do at this point. Um, you don't want to you don't want to get too crazy with it, but you can do that. Just kind of let it roll around. All right, let's get some blue. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop some. This is part of the wet and wet technique that um, I'm talking. Uh, I've been uh, showing you guys, um, and I'm going to drop some of the color into um, this red cloud that I've created. And all I'm going to do, I'm not going. I'm just going to let it barely touch. So I let it barely touch with the corner in there. And let's just have it start down here. And if you want, you could also do, let me, let's do this, let's clean that brush out. Again, I have the two, two wells of water, one for cleaning my brushes, one for a clean water source. So what I don't want to do, because again, cross-contamination is something we want to avoid. Um, and I don't want to dip my brush in here and then bring it to my red or my blue or my yellow, because this is contaminated water. And when I bring that contaminated water in here, it's gonna it's gonna contaminate my paint here, and it's gonna because I want these to stay pure. I want my red, my my orange, or my blue, and my yellow to stay pure. All right, so let's take a look at what this wet and wet technique is doing. You can see where that capillary action is taking that pigment, spreading it out, pulling it, and it's creating uh, you know like an abstract shape. Um, it's always fun to watch this. You know, as you're as you're playing around and practicing in these colors um, or in, in the watercolor, it's fun just to watch it. Drop in some different colors, but be careful not to drop too many colors in there um, because then that's when it can get a little bit muddy. Now, this technique works really great when you're trying to create a background um, or if you're trying to create some effects like in within petals with a flower where they're bleeding together kind of, this is a great technique where you can kind of lay, lay down your color um, and then drop in some color. Um, like if you, let me just, let me do one real quick. Actually, let me do this. Let me get some yellow. I sprayed my yellow there to get moist. I'm gonna put some water in here, oops. And let me show you what I mean. This is going to be very rustic. So let me draw, I'm just going to draw a simple, like, like a leaf shape here. That's almost like, almost like a petal. Okay, so I have something that's like something that resembles what could be the petal of a flower there, right? When I, I'm using yellow here, I'm just using it raw, raw yellow, using my half inch flat brush to lay the initial color down. Now there's one of two things that I could do here now that I have this, this wash down, that wash of yellow down. One of two things that I could do, I could let it dry. I could grab my blow, my wife's blow dryer and I could dry it really quickly. And then I can go in um, and with a uh, one of my round brushes, I could go in there and then I could uh, apply some lines, some to create, um, like I could mix, let me just do this here. If I were to mix yellow and red together to create an orange. I could put that on top of here to kind of create like the lines in the petals. Like sometimes you can kind of see ribs and line in the petal and that'll be starting to create some of that detail. Or what I could do is I could just go straight in while it's still quite damp. Let me hold this close so you all can see this when it happens. I'm gonna make my orange, mixing my red and yellow together. And if I put it at the top here and hold it at a slight angle, what that does is that orange starts to bleed down. See how that's happening? 
And I could add more if I want to, to the top. And it starts creating a gradient. Like that. So that's what this technique is really great for. It allows you to kind of create a, that wet and wet. And then again, once you've done that, walk away. Don't, don't, don't touch it, leave it alone. Be patient. That's number, that's number one on our watercolor tips is be patient. Let it do its thing, let it dry out and then see what the effect is and what, what has happened. Um, one of the things that's hard to do is to, it's hard to control watercolor, so don't even try. Just let it do its thing and practice, practice, practice. Okay, awesome. All right, um, so let's move on to another technique here. Um, let's talk about dry brush. Um, and what dry brush is, and let me find that fan brush. I'll put it away somewhere. Would you have time for a quick question, Nick? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So someone uh, wanted to know um, what does uh, some people use salt in, in watercoloring? So what does that do? You, somebody beat me to the punch. Um, <laughs> salt does this. I was going to close out. Um, somebody got ahead, but that's great. But that's what salt does. Um, so that's a little bit more of an advanced technique. I was just going to mention it as an additional technique that you can play around with. Um, but when you have a wet surface and you drop salt on it, what salt does is as it kind of dissolves, it forces and pushes out the pigment away from the water, away from the surface. And it creates these neat like effects, almost like um, the, they almost like look like uh, snowflakes, but that's what um, salt can do. Uh, and since we're talking about it, uh, talking about alternative techniques, Alcohol, if you have some isopropyl, this is what that does. If you lay down a wash, let the wash dry out just a little bit, let it get to damp. Um, it won't work, this technique won't work if you're working on a uh, very wet surface because the alcohol will just dissolve into that water. Um, but if you have a slightly damp surface and you can um, sprinkle or uh, splatter some alcohol, on top of that surface, this is what that, this is the effect that it creates. Really neat. There's all sorts of different things that you can do. Um, but as a beginner, I strictly recommend that, at, you know, um, mess around with these techniques first. Mess around with the basic, these foundational techniques that I feel you should really concentrate on and work on first. The, the regular washes, the wet into dry. Um, let me mark this down so that you all can see it. So wet on dry, and then wet in wet. So those, these are the main, two main techniques that are used. Um, but there's also a dry brush. Now what dry brush is, is when you have a brush that is um, not, not entirely dry, but that the, um, you've scrubbed, you've kind of, removed a lot of the pigment off of there and you're just scrubbing it on your page and letting the sur or your, your surface and letting the texture on the surface pull out uh, some of uh, that, um, some of the pigment that's remaining, some of the paint that's still remaining on your brush. That's where this guy comes in like a nice little, um, a nice little, uh, uh, this is a dish sponge. Um, there's natural sponges out there. They can be expensive. Um, I'm just using a regular disc sponge here. It's already dampened. It's not wet. It's, it's not like saturated wet, but it's damp. Um, and what I use this for is, let me just get some, let's get blue in here. And this technique works when you have more of a thicker uh, watercolor. Um, I forgot to mention that. I'm really sorry um, that, um, Try the amount of pigment that's actually in your water. Um, that's one great thing to practice is when you have a thinner paint, which means that it's more water, less pigment, um, try seeing how that dries and then slowly add more of the watercolor paint to the water. And you can see as it gets thicker, how more, how opaque it becomes, um, where you're seeing less of the paper uh, the white of the paper on it. So I'm gonna, and, and for this 
dry brush technique, um, do the same thing. Try it out uh, with a um, thinner wash or a thinner uh, paint and then you know add more pigment to it and see how it reacts. Because you'll notice that when you're using a thinner, um, a, a thinner uh, paint, um, it's going to, the, the effect is not going to be as dramatic as when you're using a paint that has um, a heavier viscosity. Um, before I actually do the, um, the, the dry brush, what I want to show you is this, with this fan brush, how awesome, how neat this fan brush can be. Because when you create your strokes, you see when I put the pigment in there, and again, this is a thicker, it's a thicker solution for lack of a better term. Um, not as thin, so it has more pigment in the water. It, that's what happens to the brush. And the nice thing is that it creates these kind of rough strokes like that. Let me hold this up to you so you can kind of see. You see that? So it creates um, those uneven rough strokes like that. When it comes to dry brushing, what you want to do is take your sponge. You could also do this with a paper towel if you don't want to ruin a ruin a disc sponge, but um, you take it and you just kind of rub out some of that pigment like that. And then you come to your surface and you do that. And you let the texture of your surface pull out what's remaining. Now I'm being very, for the sake of time, I because we got about eight minutes left, for the sake of time, I was very sloppy with that dry brush technique, but you can see what happens. And this will dry really quickly, but this is great for adding texture. This will add some great texture to your watercolor paintings. Um, so practice this, um, practice that technique. Before I leave you, um, what I want to make sure you guys understand, and so you can actually start making a painting and start building out a painting, is that with watercolor, we work in layers. Um, that's how you build up your values. That's how you build up your, um, your detail. And you always, like I said, remember, work from light to dark. These are my water, main watercolor tips today. If there's anything that you take from this, be patient, work light to dark, and leave it alone. Don't mess with it too much. Just let it do its thing. Let it dry. You'll even notice um, if you were to, like I'm letting this wash dry, and it's doing its thing, right? Um, but if I were to go in there with a hair dryer, you'll notice it'll dry different than when you just let it dry by itself. So um, up here, this wet in on dry that I I started out with, I can come back in here now because now it's it's pretty much dry, pretty much dry. And then I can start layering darker, some darker marks on top of this. So I don't know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make some stuff up here. So you can see that we layer things on top. And that might be a little too opaque, might have gone too far with it. But think of it like um, you have thin sheets, like really, really thin sheets of tinted saran wrap um, or cellophane. And you're layering those after they dry. So you let one, you start with your base, um, coat more or less like your underpainting coat and you let that dry and then you start you can start applying other um, strokes of color on top of that um, to really build up and forgive me here well, I mix some colors real quick and you can start layering colors on top in those different washes um, that got a little brown. It's not really dark enough because I was sloppy and I didn't wash my brush out well enough. But as you can see, this is what watercolor is all about. It's all about layering and how those layers, as you build them up, they start, it, they start to, because um, they're transparent, so you get different colors and different effects happening. So that's that's the core basic that that is this is the core of watercolor right here is just letting your building your layers up going light to dark now um, white um, I don't use white in my watercolor I don't even use white to lighten a color um, 
some watercolor artists use it and that's awesome. They're because they're really good at it. My white is the white of the paper. Those are my highlights. So if I'm painting something and generally I don't like working from memory, I like using reference images. Um, so that's a that's a conversation in another another class for another day. Um, but again, since this class was primarily about foundation, uh, basics, super basics, super introduction, these core techniques. Um, but um, oh gosh, I lost my chain of thought. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> I'm going too fast. Um, but for me, uh, let me just show you an example of a painting I'm kind of working. I love dinosaurs. Um, so this is something that I have in progress. I'm using, I'm doing, I'm creating this on an illustration board. Um, but all these techniques that I just showed you right here are present here. But I, I tend to work multi, in multimedia. Um, um, so uh, what's included on this, uh, I use watercolor as a base to create my colors. And then I start adding more, I'll use ink. I use ink, I use ball, um, so I, if you guys can see, there's some line work in the Tyrannosaurus here. Um, and so that that's layered on top of all those washes. And um, uh, that's what's the darker parts in there. Um, and so I use watercolor basically as that foundational uh, underpainting. Um, and then I start building up my details with pen and ink, or I even come in with acrylic. White, that's what I remember. Forgive me. Um, white. Um, so I, use, I try to retain, like if I have certain highlights, if I'm strictly doing watercolor, like here, if I was making a watercolor painting, and if I was, you, if I was working from a reference image, what I try to locate are where my highlights, my whitest whites are, and I make sure that that gets retained on the paper. So I don't paint on that. Um, so when I do my drawing, I make sure, like, I'm just making something up here. I'm drawing a um, an eye, so to speak. And you know how in, in, in the eye, there's a highlight in the eye on the iris. I make sure that, that I don't, and I know I'm doing this in pencil, but for the sake of time, I'm trying to do this quickly so you all can see but there's always that highlight, right? I was super fast because I have like one minute left, but I try to retain. So that highlight is the white of the paper. And that's the same thing in watercolor. All right, so um, looks like we're just about out of time there. I hope that this was helpful. I hope that you were able to get something out of this. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was a lot. Um, I know you probably were hoping that I could paint something. Um, maybe I'll sign, I'll, I'll get set up to do another class where we actually do paint an object, um, maybe a bird or a flower, a dinosaur, uh, I don't know. Um, but then I can show you how these uh, techniques are, are actually applied. Um, again, this class has been recorded. So if you missed something, um, cause I know I was going really fast, you, it's going to be available on the michaels.com slash classes website, um, in about 24 to 48 hours. If you want to follow me, um, could you give the overhead again real quick? Um, if you're interested, um, my, you can follow me and see more um, on my Instagram. And that is at Nick underscore Mike. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, and also one last thing. Make sure if you're creating your artwork and posting it on on Michaels or on it's Michaels anywhere on the uh, uh, on social media, make sure you, you you tag it with the made it or made with Michaels. And actually, it should be make it with Michaels. Awesome. Again, my name is Nick Mikesell. Thank you all for joining me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have a great day. Take care, everybody. Bye.